So this is going to be weird. Are you ready? Full disclosure. I have played Dragon Age the Veil card. I've played a lot of it, like a lot of it and uh, way more than I would have expected to have gotten the chance to play, if that makes sense. And I, I also, let me see if I can find, here it is. Um, I met some amazing people. I showed you guys this picture before Wolfheart was there, uh, another YouTuber. If you don't know uh, Wolfheart, makes some really good content, specifically focused on like GPU or GPUs <laughs> on uh, RPGs. We've been talking too much about the PS5 Pro, but a lot of stuff on like RPGs, analyses of those and stuff like that. Really, really nice guy, fantastic hair, everything you'd want in a creator that, that doesn't have, as somebody in chat said just a few minutes ago, a spider web on, uh, on their head <laughs> like me. <laughs> I need a haircut so bad. Uh, but as you can see, he posted this picture on September 5th. We saw some Dragon Age stuff, but you can't look yet. I have many thoughts together. And you can see we got the one and only Wolfheart, Luality, I'm over there. There's some other people past me. I'm not sure if they want their face revealed because a lot of the people there were people that do videos, but only through their voice and stuff. So they don't do face reveals, which is why it's nice that my gigantic melon head is blocking everybody behind me. But we did get to go to try Dragon Age the Veil Guard, and we played a lot of it. The reason I'm saying this is because my impressions are lifted on the 19th. That's when the embargo is up and I'm allowed to talk about it. As a result, this is like a little weird, little weird, because I have opinions on the game. I've played a lot of it. And IGN just got the chance to reveal their exclusive first hands-on preview. As a result of that, in this 13 minute video, they talk about their impressions of the game. I've not watched this yet. I've, I've read the first line where they, they say, we're pleased to say that we walked away with excitement and curiosity, but mostly relief to wave many of our concerns goodbye. So I have opinions on this. Maybe I agree totally. Maybe I agree even more. Maybe I disagree forcefully. Maybe I think it sucked. Maybe I think it's amazing and a game of the year contender. I'm not allowed to tell you. I'm not allowed to tell you. So they sent us an email describing kind of how we should navigate this because they're like, obviously IGN's impressions are going to go up ahead of time. You're still under embargo, but we don't want you to be, we don't want you to, to be muzzled and not be able to talk about this. So you can talk about it. We just ask that you keep your personal impressions and opinions private until the embargo lifts. And uh, you can talk about what you think of their impressions, but you can't bring up your impressions. So it's a fine line to walk, okay? But basically what this is going to look like is we're going to look at this. And if they say something like, in our time with the game, we noticed that that this combat worked this way and and it was good. If I think it was bad, in my experience, I'm not going to verbalize that. I'm going to make, okay, interesting. If I agree it was really good, I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, interesting. But basically, I'm going to look at this from the perspective of myself as of two weeks ago, before I played the game. Okay? Why so convoluted? Because it's that's just where we are, 2024. Ooh, baby. So let's see what IGN thought of Dragon Age the Veil Guard. Going into this, I think a lot of people are cautiously optimistic, though I would argue justifiably skeptical, because the last two games from Bioware were colossal flops. And if that like if that doesn't earn skepticism towards this release, I don't know what does. So, uh, we held like BGS's feet to the fire with Starfield after Fallout 76. As a result here, we're going to hold their feet to the fire and demand that they impress us. Now, I've already done a skeptical look video where we looked at uh previews and we looked at interviews and stuff. So, We've looked at that. That video went up before I ever, you know, went to this event and saw the game. But my big thing is I've said that I think they're doing a lot of things right. They're being very transparent with the game. They're not trying to hide it away like they did back with Anthem and Andromeda to a lesser extent. Andromeda, they let people preview it. And those people did say that it was it was pretty busted ahead of time. But they're doing everything right in terms of transparency. And then they also are, I think alleviating a lot of the concerns I've had in terms of performance, where they specifically are willing to say things like actual Spidey. What what are you, spider? Left, there's a spider somewhere. I'm looking. I'm looking through the frame. Oh, wait, there is a spider. 
Is it hanging from the light? It's hanging from the boom arm. Dude, how did you guys spot that? Oh, I lost it. Oh no, it's there. Dude, that's insane. Do you see it? Oh my God, how did you guys see that? I take back everything I said about YouTube compression. I am, I'm very impressed right now. That's crazy. That's so funny. That's so funny. Okay, well, screw me. Yeah, the web was there. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So Bill, uh, Bill Long, uh, Bill Longpre, uh, with his super chat, super chat 10 minutes ago, anyone else seeing a spider web on Luke's head and Ryan hallucinate? There was a spider web right here and somehow you saw it. So you win chat for the day. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. Anyway, I don't even remember what I was saying. That's crazy. You broke my brain. They've done a lot of things too. I think quell concerns specifically with like saying that it's steam deck verified like two months ahead of time. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And it seems like they've done other things to increase confidence, which is why these people are saying they have positive opinions. Let's see what they said. But first, a message from our spot. No, I'm kidding. Okay, let's go. It's been 10 long years since Dragon Age Inquisition, and the expectations for the next game in the series, Dragon Age the Veilguard, vale seem impossible. A full decade, a bevy of behind the scenes changes, and an interesting start to its marketing campaign made me a little worried for my most highly anticipated game of the year. A little worried is a good way of putting it. I'm, I'm telling you, we were at, I'm, maybe I'm breaking, I don't think this is breaking news because everybody talked about this. Like everybody, even before the event was like, I hope this is better than that first trailer. Everybody, even people at Bioware were not that impressed with that first trailer, which I thought was very interesting. I admire you. What you've been through would break most people. But one of my biggest concerns, based on early previews, was that it could be headed in the direction of being a linear action game, rather than its more open world predecessor. While Dragon Age is known for changing its style with each installment, I hoped dearly that it wouldn't lose too much of the DA DNA I fell in love with. After hours of hands-on time spread across two days, I'm pleased to say that I walked away with excitement and curiosity, but mostly relief to wave many of those concerns goodbye. Mm. So specifically, she's saying that the, the concerns she had that this was not going to be a very robust RPG, those concerns are alleviated. Interesting. My time with the Veilguard covered a wide smattering of things, including the incredibly expansive character creator, the introductory quests, a faction mission, and a companion quest a little deeper into the game. But Dude, as we look at this footage, just watch the hair physics. The hair physics is crazy. Like, just watch as they're running, as they're, like, cutscenes, everything. The hair physics is... I, I cannot think of a game that has done it this impressively in a long time. I mean, since NVIDIA hair works were a thing, and even then it was kind of like, uh, kind of looked like you're walking around with ramen noodles on your head. But the, uh, yeah, Stellar Blade too, but Stellar Blade, I think the over-reliance on FSR and like upscalers on consoles specifically made the hair look really grainy and not great. But even in this footage, which I'm assuming is PC, because that's just typically how this works uh, at, at preview events. I mean, even in the picture you saw, even if I'm not like saying what it was where is it i mean you can you can see that we're we're playing on pc so i'm i'm assuming that this preview is from the same event that we went to that's my impression and so i would assume that this is a, a pc collection of footage but still the hair is crazy i was mostly pleased with my ability to just explore northern thetis and all its gorgeously designed glory experiencing a setting in Dragon Age lore that we've really only heard about. To be clear, the Veilguard vale isn't the open world playground that Inquisition was. As game director Corinne Bush has previously stated, it's more mission based. But what impressed me after the first few hours was how much exploration can still be done in the various regions, as well as the impact the player character, Rook, can have on those regions. And there we go, easy. Wow, isn't that something? Consider it something of a mix of Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition. The more streamlined approach of the former. Like, come on, look at that hair. That's crazy. With the geographically and sociopolitically diverse world of the latter. 
Of course, some of the bigger art style, combat, and gameplay changes will be subject to personal taste. But after my time with the Veil Guard, I left feeling like these 10 long years just might have been worth the wait. As fans have already seen from the first gameplay trailer, players are dropped right into the city of Minrathis in the middle of the action as Solus prepares a ritual that will devastate Thetis. Luckily, our old friend Varric has recruited you to help, and it barely takes a couple of minutes for the game to put the focus on Rook. After I had a thought when I saw this sequence, which they've shown before, they like it opens with the bar fight. Do you guys remember in Mass Effect Andromeda, the bar fight clips that went viral? I wonder if this is like a direct answer to that, to be like, look, it's good now. We can do bar fights now. I, I, I really wonder if that was like a conscious choice. Cause you remember like the Krabby Cat video where they show like them punching and, and stuff in the bar fight. This I think is it. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, I wonder if this, this bar fight is like a direct thing of like, see, it's better now. You know, I really wonder if that's what this is. Maybe it's just totally unrelated, which would also be a little funny, but I, I do wonder if, if they decided to showcase this just to be like, see, see, it's not like that. It's way better now. Which it is, to be fair. I mean, this is way better. <laughs> After a surprisingly concise story recap from Varric, there are a number of aspects the Veil Guard starts easing you into. For one, the combat. Gone are the days of Dragon Age Origins more CRPG-inspired tactical system, offering a style that's a mix of quick action and a mechanic where you can pause and pull up your radial menu. While this absolutely does take some getting used to, and it'll be a gradual process to create what could be a highly customized build while learning all your companions' different abilities, it didn't take me long to actually start having fun with it. I largely played mage and rogue builds during my hands-on time and also quickly started to lean on certain companions' abilities. For one, the mage healing ability was essential. For one particularly difficult remnant, I basically established a pattern where I was only using Bellara's mana to heal me, dodging and playing it safe when it got too risky. Nev's ability to slow time was also one I kept returning to, offering a bit more control on the battlefield when the situation got a little too fast-paced. And for you glass cannon builds out there, you'll want to have a warrior around to taunt your enemies out of your way. Oh my god, lock the camera. No problem. Jesus. Like a whole lot in the Veil Guard, combat revolves around your companions, even though you can't fully take control of them like in previous Dragon Age games. Different companions have different combo options together, and there are certainly opportunities to build team synergy. Mm. Oh, and you'll want to listen to your companions in combat too, as they'll occasionally drop some useful hints. But combat aside, your dialogue choices, your rook's background, and the frequent decisions you make are immediately important, which shouldn't be too surprising for fans of Bioware games. The dialogue wheel is back, of course, as is the approval-disapproval system. We haven't got a lot of time. Varric said you had a lead on Solus. You get right to the point. But I was surprised to see that the Veil Guard actually explains the consequences of some of your dialogue choices in very clear terms. See you say that. It's a variation of the so-and-so will remember that system, but more specific. But we do have Nev's location now, so... Take, for example, my first confrontation with Solus, aka Fen'Harel, aka the Dreadwolf. I chose a more sarcastic, humorous approach with him, and at the end of our confrontation, text on the side of the screen informed me that I have traded verbal jabs with Solus. This is your responsibility now. It was far from the- I will say I do genuinely like RPGs, just clearly tell you when something had an effect, because there's nothing that drives me more crazy than playing an RPG where you think you just made like a big moment, a big choice, and then it just doesn't go anywhere. You know, like that, that drives me crazy. We're like, that was, oh baby, here we go. Let's see how that comes back to haunt me. And then it has no impact whatsoever. So I appreciate that as we can see here, like there, it's almost like the fallout system. Like you remember new Vegas, it's like, you've done that. Everybody disliked that or your reputation with this faction dropped. Like. Some people think it's it's a little too on the nose. I, I love it. I like that clear disclosure. 
The only occurrence of this sort of text, and it leaves me curious as to how your relationships with various characters will build and branch out over time based on your attitude. Speaking of consequences, it quickly became clear to me that there would consistently be tons of choices in the Veil Guard that'll have lasting results. It probably sounds like I'm stating the obvious here, but I got the sense that even more of these kinds of choices might be peppered throughout than the usual Bioware game. Right at the beginning, for instance... Let me hear that again. More of these kinds of choices probably sounds like I'm stating the obvious here, but I got the sense that even more of these kinds of choices might be peppered throughout than the usual Bioware game. Even more like narrative RPG choices might be peppered throughout than a normal, presumably good, Bioware game. Mm. Right at the beginning, for instance, I made a choice that led to Harding getting injured, and she was still bruised up for the remainder of the next couple hours. I felt like a real jerk about it, and that was probably the point. Honestly, pretty impressive bruising, too. It's actually not that easy to make, like, bruises and injuries on characters look good. Um, it's almost like stage makeup. Like, you know, you see a play, and it's just like, oh, they put a red on their cheek. That was that. Like, it actually looks like she got pretty effed up. Oh Dragon Age the Veil Guard seemed to be telling me, right from the start, that I'm going to feel like a jerk a lot. You don't slow down for much, do you? Without spoiling too much, you'll also be able to see some of your progression and choices in the environment around you as well. But once introductions were out of the way, it was time to explore the wide world of Thetis and see its past and present collide. Shall we? Let's do this. Veil jumping. As mentioned earlier, one of my biggest worries was that the Veil Guard could end up being more linear in its approach, trading branching gameplay for a straight line. And sure, the opening hours, essentially the tutorial zone, are a little railroady, save for a couple key decisions you have to make. But once you're past that and more established with an Act 1, you're much more free to tackle quests as you please as you unlock more and more regions. You do this via the crossroads. For those of you who aren't brushed up on your Dragon Age lore, that's a nexus between the waking world of Thetis and the metaphysical realm of the Fade through which the ancient elves would travel through magical mirrors called Alluvians. You now use the Alluvians for that same purpose, and to unlock new regions, you have to fight through certain areas of the crossroads before you can start fast traveling to them. Unlocking said regions opens up a vast network of areas, and not unlike past Dragon Age games, they're dramatically different from one another. As the gods champion passed freely, so will you. Take, for example, the Arlithan Forest, a gorgeous, colorful region that mixes greenery with elven magic. You can see nugs burrow into the grass, magical artifacts abound, and there's a vast array of nature to simply admire. You're hit with a massive tone shift, however, when you head to Hosburg. Lavendel Village. Whatever happened here looks like Demeter's Crossing. Currently under siege by the Blight, here is where you'll see some of the more horror-inspired aesthetics, and frankly, just some of the grosser aspects of the Blight. While the Veil Guard's tone certainly leans more high fantasy in places like the Crossroads, don't worry. Those who miss the gore and dark fantasy of Origins will find that too in places where the Blight has spread. This answers a specific question a lot of people have had, which is that they feel like the footage they've seen so far is very lighthearted, very like high fantasy, very like pop culture fantasy. You know, there's not a lot of of darkness in it. There's not a lot of depth there, which I understand how some people might prefer that kind of less serious, lower stake fantasy. But I I personally like I I love darker fantasy. I love fantasy where it's like there's this amazing power within magic and it makes sense that people would grow corrupted by it that that there would be evil that persists, that there would be people that use it in violent and destructive ways. And I like to explore those human themes of corruption and power and and uh greed and and things in the context of a more magical and fantastical world and so i've been worried about that as well is the the fact that that first trailer made it seem much more lighthearted. you know that first trailer made it seem like like you know marvel was making this which was quite worrying but she's saying specifically that you will find the darker stuff which, I mean, that's exactly what you would hope, right? Certainly leans more high fantasy in places like the crossroads. Don't worry. Those who miss the gore and dark fantasy of origins will find that too in places where the blight has spread. 
but I couldn't help but spend a lot of my time just running around in Treviso, the bustling city that's home to the Antivan Crows faction. For one thing, a lively city feels like a novelty in Dragon Age, but there was simply so much to explore that I kept getting sidetracked. A merchant with unique items here, a new quest to pick up over there, and a random combat encounter over there. And that's just when I wasn't looking around for a cat or dog to pet. Because yes, you can pet the cats and dogs. 10 out of 10 IGN. Outside of the cats and dogs, there are some unique ways to interact with the environment as well. Each companion has an environmental ability, some of which came in quite handy for me. In my time in the Arlathan Forest, I frequently called upon Bellara, whose environmental ability allows her to tinker with magical artifacts. In a nice quality of life feature, your companions don't even need to be in your party in order for you to use these abilities. As an aside, another one of my favorite quality of life additions is the fact that party banter pauses and picks up again later if you trigger combat a cutscene, or anything else that would interrupt their dialogue. That's right, no more awkward standing around in order to hear the complete conversation. Oh, yes. If you're feeling overwhelmed, the difficulty and accessibility options do allow for about just as much or as little hand-holding as you need. For example, with one Antivan Crow's quest I was doing, I could turn the navigation on and simply follow the game's guidance, or turn it off and look for clues in the environment to follow. In this case, the crow's purple symbol painted on certain walls. I do like that as well. One of the things I've said, if you've played The Witcher 3 before, this is like a little, little, uh, if you want to replay it, hack for you. The Witcher 3 is built in a way where they actually do give you enough, like, enough guidance within dialogue to navigate levels and find objectives. So usually what they'll say is like, ah, yes, go find this building with the red door next to the tilting tower. Let's come unstable after years of wear. And then you go, and if you look for the tilting building, you can find the door that's red and then find your way in. And so you can actually turn off like the UI and the objective markers and stuff in The Witcher 3 and play it and find your objectives without needing the points of interest, like guiding you there specifically. And I encourage you to try playing it it that way because it'll make you appreciate the environment so much more whereas a lot of the time when you're playing with just quest markers and stuff your eyes are just focused exactly on the white dot or your eyes are focused up here and you're just following the objective markers so i encourage you to try playing some games like that other games like assassin's creative experimented with it with i think they call it adventure mode where it turns off the guidance and you can just they'll say like they're on the coast by the the docks and they sail a, a boat with a crab printed on the sail or something exploration mode is that what they call it i recommend you try that because it really does make it much more immersive i love that kind of thing another mark this way i also just happened to be playing an antivan crow rook while completing this quest which led to some fun dialogue options we crows are all the army antiva has but it's not like we can feel the garrison once I was in the thick of things, I could clearly see the features in the Veil Guard that boiled down to, okay, okay, we heard the complaints about Inquisition, specifically addressing the infamous Hinterlands problem, which is a reference to the first open world area players visit in Inquisition. The zone was packed with more than 50 side quests, many of which boiled down to mere fetch quests, and it left many players drowning in a bevy of checklists that felt inconsequential to the story. The Veil I remember um, my wife, Nikki, she was telling me how she thought that that was the whole game when she first played it because she didn't look at like any reviews, no, like nothing. She just played it and she thought that the, the Hinterlands was like, that was it. That was the whole thing. And so she's like, oh, well, the, the game's pretty underwhelming. And then she realized, no, that like that's just the starter area. And then the game actually starts. <laughs> and so for her, it was a bit of a roller coaster. Yeah. Well, Guard has boiled this down quite a lot. You're still free to explore, but the scope isn't nearly as dizzying, and the quests point back to the main story, a region or faction, or a companion. Another clear reaction to criticisms of Inquisition are our villains in the Veil Guard, Elgrenon and Gilanane. The two elven gods feel much more present throughout the events of the early game than Corypheus, the frankly lackluster baddie of Inquisition. Whatever comes, we're ready for a fight. Words easily said, but rarely proven. While there's a whole lot more Thetas to see and talk about, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it back home to the lighthouse. The lighthouse will likely be the most important location of the Veilguard. 
serving as the hub for you and your companions. Each one of your companions has their own room, and conveniently, a light shines outside of their door when they have a cutscene available. Once you get further into Act 1, it certainly starts to feel more lived in, and you can discover some pretty charming character quirks. For example, I found that Emmerich's skeletal assistant Manfred enjoys spending time on the balcony, and we even got a few games of rock, paper, scissors in. The lighthouse is also, obviously, where you're able to do some housekeeping, especially when it comes to the caretaker. Offer, dweller. I will answer. This wildly helpful spirit is always standing by to help you enchant and upgrade armor for you and your companions. But I found the lighthouse somewhat symbolic of one of the biggest challenges this game is facing, bringing in new players while honoring the now incredibly vast lore that Dragon Age has built across the games, comic books, short stories, and more. Basically, if you are worried that the name change from Dragon Age Dreadwolf would mean less Solus, think again. His history, along with the history of the other elven gods, is baked into the lighthouse, and you learn more and more about the threat you face as you unlock Solus's murals with various wolf statues. You even get to see some of his memories firsthand. Oh. They need gods who can protect them. We are not gods. You will learn that. As a lore nerd, I very much appreciated this, as well as the various other callbacks to series history. The Origins fans will likely love the Grey Warden heavy quests, and we already know the Inquisitor will be involved in some way, as you can recreate them and select your world states in the character creator. But mm. Hmm, interesting. But I do wonder if it'll overwhelm new players, which Bioware certainly seems to be courting with its action-heavy combat system. That's why it helps, at least, to have something of an outsider like Rook to take the helm of the Veilguard. Plus, the scrappiness of Rook reminded me a bit of playing as Hawk in Dragon Age 2, rather than the more Chosen One-esque protagonist of the Warden in Origins and the Inquisitor in Inquisition. In short, a lot changed in Dragon Age the Veilguard, but there was so much I was relieved to see stay. The focus on companions and romance, the rich lore, and a gorgeous world to explore. It goes without saying that there's still a ton of the Veilguard that I haven't seen, especially if it's as big as Origins and Inquisition, and it certainly seems like it. But after finishing my preview, I found myself even more eager to dive into it, and much more hopeful that this could be the hit Bioware needs. That's... That's quite optimistic. I will say, I don't think that, that anybody has been able to get them to say how big this is. I don't think anybody's gotten them to say that. Um, because I've looked at articles, I've looked at previews, I've looked at everything that's come out so far, and I haven't heard anybody say, oh, it's expected to be 80 hours or 50 or 20. Like, I haven't heard anybody say that. So as far as I'm aware, they're keeping that close to their chest, which is interesting. It's very interesting. So sound short then? Well, no, no. It just means that they don't want to put a number on it because like that might not be that beneficial. You know, it's it's just like if you know that the game is expected to be 10 hours long or 20 or 30 or 40, like that might change how you play it. Whereas if they just leave it totally open ended, then they just don't have to stress about it. And if it really is like a, a robust RPG, the odds are pretty high that your choices could lengthen or shorten that. So you just don't know. And then beyond that, they're still like, what, uh, a month and a half out from launch. So you just you don't know. Um, what I will say is based on that preview, I mean, that I would consider to be a very positive preview. Granted, I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's IGN. And for a lot of people, that's not uh, perhaps the most reliable outlet, which is totally fair and totally fine, especially after things like uh, they're reporting on Black Myth Wukong, where they were really, really dedicated to bashing that game for whatever reason. They just picked it as their uh, their target. So. I, I can understand why some people might not be like, eh, I'll, I'll believe it when I see other people's impressions, which is totally, totally fair. And those impressions will come on the 19th, which is whatever, next Thursday. Next Thursday. So this coming Thursday, you'll get to hear what people like me, people like Wolfhart thought of it. I'm sure there will be lots of lots of impressions they give Deathborn a seven yeah ign did the tough thing with ign and most of these big websites is that they have so many employees that like they'll send sarah to review Dustborn and then dave to review dragon age and then then jessica goes and reviews uh what was the other one they gave a seven that was like really bad uh oh concord like they'll they'll give all these people and so basically you got three different people that gave 
three very, very different games, seven out of tens. And it's just, I, I think it leads to a lot more confusion than people realize. He took my thing.